Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to our reading of the Gospel according to St. Luke in the King James Version. We are up to chapter 20, and those of you who merely look at Wikipedia will know we don't have many chapters to go. Jesus is now in Jerusalem. He will not be leaving Jerusalem as a living person. Uh, he has now come into direct confrontation with the people who have the power of life and death over him and his followers, the chief priests and elders of the temple, and it is, it is an extremely contentious relationship and it's just going to get worse we've already been told that they want to do him harm and he has walked voluntarily straight into their living room straight into their the center of their power and taunted them and we've been told it's been made clear a couple of times by now and we're, it's going to be made even clearer in this chapter that he is largely protected by the huge crowds that he brought with him to jerusalem that sang him into the city as the coming of a king uh, so this is chapter 20, and it has uh, a parable in it that if yesterday's parable mystified me, this one, even worse. We've gone through it before. We'll go through it again here. And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders and spoke unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority dost thou these things? Or who is it that gave thee this authority? And he answered and said unto them, I will, ask, I will also ask you one thing, and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Referring here to John the Baptist, who also commanded huge crowds, including large numbers of people who are in the audience that Jesus has been teaching for months and months. Uh, and they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then believe ye him not? Because they scorned John and did not exactly lament when uh, he was killed, when he was executed. But if we say, of men, all the people will stone us, for they be, they, they be persuaded that John was a prophet. And they answered that they could not tell whence it was. And Jesus said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. And it was just the opening. We're just out of the gate. And also, I'm, I'm largely certain that you can't hear a word I'm saying because of the background noise. But... Uh, I'm already confused here. Uh, this has always confused me in a couple of ways. First of all, we get that note again. It made it explicit. The, the elders and the chief priests of the temple cannot confront Jesus directly because they're afraid of the crowd that's all around him. They're afraid of being killed. This passage tells us they're afraid the crowd will murder them. But also, what is going on here? Jesus has demonstrated in, in three Gospels now on many, many occasions that when we're told that a character has gone off and reasoned with themselves or spoke among themselves, he supernaturally knows what they're thinking or saying. So he must know that now. And yet, he plays a verbal trick on them. The, he, knows perfect, he must know perfectly well that the reason they're not saying what they actually think, which is, of course, that John's authority came from men, not from God. That is their answer. It's not like they don't know their own answer. Their answer is, we didn't believe him. We thought he was a false prophet. We thought his authority came from the crowds around him, not from God. We're told that the, Jesus must know that the reason they won't say that is because they're afraid for their lives if they do. How does that in any way validate his choice not to tell them where his authority comes from? <laughs> It doesn't seem to me, in this gospel or in the two that we've read so far, it doesn't seem to me that he is all that concerned with trying to convince the powers that be that he is what he says he is. In other words, it seems like the gospel writers are working backwards to justify the human drama that developed around this story, which was an itinerant preacher became a firebrand and was executed. The writers of these things were not contemporary with these events, they, but they know the story. And it seems like they're working backwards to make that story real. When, anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, uh, then began he to speak to the people this parable. And we've heard this parable before. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season, that is the harvest season, when he would be getting a profit, uh, he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. So the owner of the vineyard, the vineyard owner, sends a servant, go to the men who are in charge of the vineyard, and collect my cut. I've hired them to take care of the vineyard. We have had a season. They have harvested. They have sent to market. Go and get my share. I'm not back myself, but I'm sending you with authority to collect my money. And instead of giving over the profits, they beat the man and send him away without anything. 
And again, he sent another servant, that is the vineyard owner, still far afield, sends another, another servant, and they beat him also, and entreated him shamefully, and sent him away empty. And again he sent the third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then sent the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall be the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is it then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. We're going to come back to the story. I want to get to the end rather than interrupt for 20 minutes. Uh, and the chief priests and scribes, the same hour, sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. And they watched him, and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, so that they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither acceptest thou the person of any, but, the, but teachest the way of God truly. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar, or no? But he perceived their craftiness, and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar's that which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. And they could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at his answer, and held their peace. They're trying to get him to speak trees. Uh, he doesn't do it in this instance. But there were already a hundred witnesses that he was ushered into Jerusalem, being uh, allowing crowds, encouraging them to hail him as a king. That's already treason. But they want, they want more, and they want in front of witnesses, I guess. Then came him a certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, say, the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection, so they're of course going to put to him a cartoonish scenario in order to straighten out some of the absurdities of, of resurrection and get him to make a fool of himself. Uh, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife uh, and died without children. And the second took a wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and in like manner the seventh also. And they also left no children, and died. Last of all, the women died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. An absurd idea, Jesus would have to make a ridiculous fool of himself to pick and then try to justify his answer, but he outfoxes them. Uh, because he says, And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, in other words, heaven, uh, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showeth at the, bu at the bush when he calleth the Lord, for, uh, the Lord God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Which confounds, uh, that confounds the Sadducees. Sorry for the screaming in the background. There is incredibly loud screaming in the background. It's not people calling to each other. It's just people throwing back their head and screaming. There's no way to avoid it. Uh, uh, and also, a little bit odd here that Jesus has to clarify that the, these dead people are, in fact, alive. Um, when his disciples have seen him with some of these people, so maybe the priests need to hear it. Uh, then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And after they, that, they durst not ask him any question at all. And he said unto them, How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord said unto my son, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thy enemies a footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord. How is he then his son? A little bit of casuistic quibbling here. The point, I think, here is that the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, apart from the crowd, quite apart from the crowd, which Jesus has at his beck and call, he's surrounded by them when he's teaching in the temple, they're also confounded by him, personally. He can get around them in these stupid 
rules and games and debate tricks that they're trying to pull. Then in the audience, all the people he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes, which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets, and the highest seats in the synagogue, and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a show make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. He doesn't say that in public. He says that to his disciples. But he is clearly vilifying these people instead of changing their hearts. There's never any attempt made to change the hearts of the Pharisees. The Pharisees or Sadducees, the priests or temple officials that can already hear the word that Jesus is speaking, fine, they will defend him. But he doesn't change any of them, uh, which is a little odd. Like I say, it's a human drama that needs to happen. There need to be enemies. But it does, that's the end of chapter 20, and it, it seems a little awkward to me. It always seems a little awkward to me. It doesn't seem like that would happen if this were you know, the scion of God coming to open men's hearts to an entirely new reality. It doesn't seem to me that, that he would have so little ratio of success. But speaking of ratio of success, let's get back to this parable about the vineyard owner. Because when the vineyard owner says, after his, his first two emissaries have been beaten up and sent away, after the third emissary has been murdered, he sends his son. And since he's referring to his son as his only begotten and beloved son, it is clear that the vineyard owner in this parable is God. If they weren't clear from any other context, it's clear there that the vineyard owner is God and that he has, he has sent his emissaries to these husbandmen. The emissaries, of course, are the prophets who are often scorned and mocked or even killed by unwilling, sinful city populations. They are, Jesus has already lamented that how poorly Jerusalem treats its prophets. Then the Son is sent. That is clearly meant to be the Christ. That is clearly meant to be the Son of God, Jesus. And what do the husbandmen do? They kill him, hoping for his inheritance. And what does that earn them? That earns them complete destruction at the hands of the vineyard owner. Okay. All right. We have been told many times uh, that when Jesus wants to confuse listeners, he talks in parables. He explains the parables to his disciples, but he, when he wants to be obscure, when he wants to make his message unclear, he talks in parables. And yet, we have heard for 2,000 years, sometimes feels like I've been present for all of those 2,000 years, we've heard from 2,000 years of homilies uh, from the Sunday pulpit, that Jesus speaks in parables in order to make himself understood to the people of his time. Jesus himself is a timeless being, eternal, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We are told, I have been told countless times, from pulpits and also in private, in private discussions of apologetics. I have been told that at this time, in the dusty wilds of Judea, Jesus could easily have talked about computers or black holes, but he didn't. He chose not to do that because he knew what his audience would understand. That's why he's constantly talking about fields and farms and vineyards. That's why he's always talking about asses and camels and whatnot, as opposed to talking about anything else. Critics of Christianity have pointed out in the last 200 years that Jesus sounds, for all the world, exactly like a denizen of his own time. He does not sound like a timeless being at all. He sounds like someone whose entire mental furniture is the mental furniture of extremely rural province of first century Judea. And the response that the faithful, that the Christian faithful have given to those criticisms has always been, he sounded that way on purpose. He's talking this way in parables about fishers and fishermen and the sun and the wind in order to make himself clear to his audience. Never mind that he says explicitly he doesn't want to be clear to that audience. That has been the defense that Christians have always given to these stories. And okay, all right, if you want to defend the stories that way, I am all ears to listen. That is interesting. That's an interesting avenue to read this material. But how does that help with this story? The story of the owner of the vineyard the people in the audience are hearing something completely alien to them. Some, the, the vineyard owner in this story behaves in a way that no one has ever behaved, that none of Jesus' listeners would ever have behaved, and they would have mocked someone they knew who behaved this way. In the real world, that vineyard owner would have sent an emissary for his profits as soon as the season came. That emissary would have been beaten and sent away without anything, and then the owner would have done something. Then the owner of the vineyard would have said, okay, I clearly didn't have the lay of the land from the men that I hired. Something has gone clearly wrong. My emissary is alive. 
They treated him poorly, but they sent him away with nothing, and he is able to tell me what he saw, which is, these guys are unregenerate, they are not going to listen to your authority, you are going to have to come in person with armed men, or get the local authorities to deal with it. But you're not going to get your share of the profits. That's not going to happen. Any one of Jesus' listeners to this story would have immediately acted that. They would have immediately understood that. None of them would have sent a second emissary. But the vineyard owner does send a second emissary and another emissary. And they are treated progressively worse. Wounded. And then what does the owner of the vineyard do? He sends his son. He sends his only son, his beloved heir. That's insane. So what happens? Naturally, the son, the son goes and is murdered. Of course he is, because a fool would know that was going to happen. Everyone in Jesus' audience knows that's going to happen. So what, what has become of the reading of the parables that says Jesus is using these everyday humble examples in order to make himself explicable to his audience? What's happened to that? That's gone. Instead, we get a... a Quite a, we've heard stories about, from Jesus about miracles. This is more unbelievable than any miracle. No human being would act the way this vineyard owner does. Yes, I understand. The point of the story is for Jesus to stick it to the Pharisees and the chief priests, these haughty people who are taking him to task and not recognizing his authority. The point of the story is to say, when you have had all these warnings, you've had all these servants come to you and you've treated them progressively worse, and then the son and heir comes and you kill him, well, what can you expect from the owner of the vineyard except complete destruction? First, according to Jesus' own doctrine, you could expect forgiveness. Uh, no one ever expects Jesus' father. No one ex ever expects God to forgive. And he almost never does. <laughs> so, so that's good. That's, a, that's informed expectation. Uh, I understand that's the point of the story. To have the whole crowd... Uh, uh, that loves Jesus and is protecting him, staring at the Pharisees saying, yeah, you do anything to the son and heir, the beloved son, you know what's going to happen to you. You're going to die. There's not going to be any mercy for you. Okay, I understand that. But the parable makes no sense. The parable is absurd. And I, I have been told for all of my, my life when discussing these very words that parables aren't supposed to be absurd. They're supposed to reflect the daily life of the people in first century Judea. Well, this doesn't. No one on earth would ever do this. The last thing they would do is send their son and heir after all that has happened. It, it baffles me. It makes the, the vineyard owner into not just a fool, but a negligent homicidal maniac. Someone, someone who's not just an, an idiot, but who causes his own son's death when he should know better. Which, if the vineyard owner is supposed to be God, that's not a good reflection. <laughs> that's not, as the kids say, a good look. Um, anyway, that's my gripe with that, with that story. We're going to have precious few more stories to gripe about or to praise. Uh, because the stories are going to start to get thinner on the ground. Things are now much more active. Jesus has gone into the temple, driven away the, the Pharisees' source of income, and mocked them to their faces. And we have been told in this chapter they are looking for a way to get at him, some way to get at him. Uh, that is only going to continue. The stakes go up from here on out. So we'll, we'll finish this up. We'll move on to the next chapter next time. Uh, so I'll see you then. Thank you, Book 2.